Now, for the past two weeks, we've focused on the second advent of our Lord in keeping with the ancient tradition of the church's observation of the Advent season. For this final Advent devotion, because next week we're going to gather for an evening of lessons and carols, I thought we should turn to the Old Testament to consider for a moment God's own pointers to the first Advent. Now, to do that, we're only going to look at one text, but it's a familiar text that speaks to the preparations for Christ's first advent, uh, specifically Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. Now, our approach here is simply going to be to walk through these verses. It's only three verses. And then turn to some concluding thoughts as we remember and celebrate the coming of the glory of the Lord in the person of Jesus Christ. As we turn to verse 3 here, I do want to say a few words uh, about the content context of these verses. First, in Isaiah's prophecy, there's a notable shift in the mood um, from Isaiah 39 to 40. The former chapter ends on a note of judgment, while the latter chapter begins with a command from God to his people to be comforted. That is quite a shift, but it highlights the fact that man's sin is not the final word. Though sin must be judged, and for Israel that meant going into exile on account of her sin, that judgment was not the end of the story. As we turn the page from Isaiah 39 to Isaiah 40, judgment yields to redemption, to comfort, to consolation. Now, it'll take the rest of the prophecy of Isaiah to unpack the full sense of this redemption, but as far as the preparations for that redemption are concerned, our verses here speak volumes. And so in verse 3, Isaiah continues, A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Just consider the significance of this verse that this unidentified voice is announcing the coming of God himself. This announcement reflects the preparations that were sometimes made in anticipation of a visit from royalty in the ancient Near East. That God's visitation is something to be celebrated, which is not always the case, is confirmed by the first two verses of Isaiah chapter 40, in which God himself is the one who commands his people to be comforted. Those famous uh, words, comfort, comfort ye my people. This is not an announcement of a visitation to find fault, but to celebrate victory. Now, commentators point out that the messenger here is firmly in the background, so that the message itself of God's visitation can be the focus of our contemplation. It's subtle, but I think an important point for us. Who declares the coming king is far less important than the declaration that the king is coming. That is to say that what saves us is not the preaching of the gospel, but the content of the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, note in this text that preparations are called for by the messenger. In a general sense, the preparations that are called for require obstacles to be cleared away from the path of the coming king. Later, when these words flow forth from the lips of John the Baptist, it is evident that these preparations are, from our perspective, spiritual preparations for hearing and receiving the message of the gospel. To be sure, salvation is all of God and his grace, even the work of the Spirit to soften our hearts to receive Christ uh, is the work of God. But from our perspective, to know our need for the King is critically important. And that is what this messenger is getting at in this verse. Now, turning to verse 4, we read, Uh, an expansion of this idea or a continuation of this idea. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. So the effect of these preparations for the coming king are are described now in verse 4. Now the language here is hyperbolic if applied to the concrete efforts and abilities of mere men. Even if these verses are taken spiritually, to present the results of man's spiritual preparations for the coming king, they are hardly believable. Isaiah has spent a long time in his prophecy pointing out Israel's inability to follow their king. But if we read these statements as the divine work that coincides with the earlier call to prepare the way for the Lord, I think they make much more sense. As the messenger announces the coming of the king and the need to be prepared, the king himself levels mountains and raises valleys so that nothing will hinder him from visiting his people. And indeed, that is his goal, as we see in Isaiah uh, 40, verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, 
and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So with every hindrance laid aside, the Lord arrives in this verse, and the glory of the Lord is revealed. But this verse is also expanding the former idea a bit, because Isaiah here says that all flesh shall, shall see it together. The emphasis here seems to be that the revelation of the glory of God will not be done in a corner, but will be manifest in such a way that all flesh as a unity, as uh, Old Testament commentator E.J. Young puts it, will see the glory of the Lord. Now, with all of that said, let me point out uh, briefly some concluding thoughts here. First, as we approach our celebration of Christmas, we approach our celebration of God's visitation of his people after a long, dark night in bondage to sin. In the Old Testament, that was represented by the exile into Babylon. Christmas, then, is really a turning point, a redemptive historical turning point of God's relationship with his people. This is not a, to downplay Easter, but to rightly place Christmas alongside Easter as the necessary foundation for what was accomplished on the cross. God had to visit his people before he acted to save them. Second, the first advent was for the sake of announcing salvation to all those who call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus' own ministry was marked by announcements of salvation over against judgment. Of course, Jesus had hard words of condemnation against those who opposed him, but he came the first time not to judge, but to save. What this means for, for us who are between these two advents is that we are living in a time of, a, of, of declaring a message of comfort. And we must share that message of comfort above all else. However, Christ's first advent should remind us of our own need for repentance and faith in him. For as amazing as it is that God has visited his people, he did call for his people to be prepared for that visit. For as amazing as it is that Christ preached a message of grace and salvation, he always called his followers to put away their sin. As E.J. Young points out, this message of comfort will only resonate with those who know their sin and their need for a Savior. And so, though we rightly celebrate Christmas as tidings of comfort and joy, we must also understand our own need for comfort in order to truly celebrate. Let's go to some questions now. First of all, how can your celebration of Christmas balance your need for repentance with the comfort and joy of this season? Second, how does Christmas reconcile Isaiah's prophecy that all flesh shall see God with the other biblical idea that no one can see God and live? Then how does that answer help you appreciate Christmas all the more, the incarnation of the Son of God? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we give you thanks uh, that uh, long ago, in many times, in many ways, uh, you declared that you would come to save your people, that you, O oh God, would uh, crush uh, the head of the serpent, that you would put away our sins, and that we would be reconciled to you. We thank you for uh, your promises. We thank you for the, the realization of them through Jesus Christ as he became uh, the incarnate son. We pray that as we await his second coming, uh, we would with great comfort and joy celebrate his, his first coming in light of his second. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen.